Today is March 8th, and we're joined by Keith McPherson from WFAN. Between the Bases starts right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Between the Bases podcast. My name is Noak, alongside me is Mo, and today we are joined by a very special guest, Keith McPherson from uh, WFAN. Keith, how are you doing today? Yo, what's up, guys? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Happy Friday. Glad we could figure out how to get some time together on the pod. Let's do it. Thank you so much. Okay, so, so, Keith, we know your story. You're from New Jersey, just like us. Now you work for WFAN. For local guys like us, you're an inspiration. When did you know you wanted to be a broadcasting? Oh, man. Um... Honestly, when I was 16, I got the opportunity to call some Pop Warner football games at Ocean Township High School, and um, I was scared. I was nervous. I think they paid me like 50 bucks for like five hours of work. But, um, you know, I'd always loved sports. I grew up watching Sports Center, watching games. And when I first got on that microphone over the loudspeaker and I, I heard myself, uh, and people told me I was pretty good, even, you know, starting off. I was like, OK, maybe I can be some type of broadcaster, announcer, host something in the sports world. Keith, how from there were you able to get the job with WFN and a Bleacher Report and all those places? Oh, man, it's a long journey um, <laughs> to go from age 16 to then breaking into the industry at 34 um, on WFAN. I- I'll try to make it quick. Um, In high school, I was a varsity quarterback. I was one of the best quarterbacks in the state at Ocean Township High School. We won the state championship. That led me to get about 10 to 15 scholarship offers. I took a scholarship to play football at James Madison University in Virginia. I didn't like it too much down there. I went in undeclared, but I, I started to get a feel for like, what I wanted to do, and that was communication. I I took some communication PR courses, public relations, and I didn't really like it. I didn't like the football down there. I didn't like being six, seven hours away from Monmouth County, New Jersey. So I transferred home back to Monmouth County, and I went to Monmouth University, and I had some options. I could have went and played football in in a bunch of different places, but specifically the reason I went to Monmouth was because they had Hawk TV, and WMCX. So they had a radio station on campus and a TV station on campus. The TV station was broadcasted to all the students in the dorms, in the uh, dining hall, in the offices, and then the radio station was 88.9 FM. So right then and there, I knew I would get an opportunity to work on my craft. I would get an opportunity to sharpen my sword. And uh, Monmouth University is where I really started to hone in on, okay, I think I can do this. I was on the radio in the summer of 2011 for three hours a day, three to six, Monday through Friday that summer. I did a music show on Hawk TV, and uh, I just really started to get comfortable doing that type of stuff. Now, this is before social media was like what it is now. You couldn't go live on your phone. You could you could barely post um, pictures on your phone. But then as I continued on, I graduated college. Nobody interviewed me. Nobody hit me up. It was ho- it was tough. It was tough. It was hard. I started to DJ more and more, and I really got my experience on the mic, emceeing, um, doing everything from uh, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, to graduation parties, to backyard barbecues, um, and that was a, a a way for me to make money and just kind of still stay like you know on the microphone in front of people. I got into the MLB fan cave in 2014 when I was working at Guitar Center selling DJ equipment. And that was my first big break. So um, we're going from when I was 16 in 2004 to, um, you know, 2014. Now I'm 26. I'm in MLB fan cave in New York City every single day. They have a TV show on site called Off the Bat. It was every Tuesday night on MTV2. I get out of the fan cave and I apply to a job at MTV2 being a social media coordinator. I worked there for two and a half years. 
And I want to get back into sports. I want to get back into what I love doing. And I remembered when I came out of high school, I didn't have any experience and it was hard to get jobs because everywhere said you needed at least experience. Now I had a year in the fan cake. Now I had two and a half years in MTV. So I quit that job. I quit that job at Fubo TV, which is a digital streaming platform for sports fans. I worked at Fubo for not even a year, and then Jay-Z's company, Rock Nation, came along. I worked at Rock Nation for three months, and I hated it, and I decided, okay, I'm going to quit this job. I'm going to buy a new camera, a new MacBook, and I'm going to hit the ground running on content creation. I was seeing a lot of people build YouTube channels, podcasts, build their own Twitter following, Instagram following, and become popular talking about sports. And I'm like, I can do that. I went to school for that. I know I have the talent. If I start now, it might take 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but this is what I want to do. And that was 2018. Fast forward to 2019. Yes Network sees me on Yankees Twitter. They put me in a commercial. We fall into the pandemic, but right before we fall into the pandemic, I start working with John Boy and John Boy Media. I do Talking Nets podcast. I do Pinstripe Strong podcast. So I have a Yankees podcast and a Brooklyn Nets podcast. And then that leads me to my big break. WFAN is the home of the Brooklyn Nets and the New York Yankees. And the new program manager at the time, Spike Eskin, he was looking for some new blood. John Boy and Jake did the midday show on August 6th. They never did another show. I got a chance to audition on August 25th, 2021. And the rest is history. I signed with WFAN in October. And then I started in November of 2021. And I've been on for three years. What was like the best piece of advice you've ever heard? You know, keep pushing to it to finally get to your goals. Oh, man, there's so much. And, and I, I use all these quotes all the time. Um, I, I really believe in um, doing things on your own so you owe people nothing. In this industry and in life, if, you, if you're consistently helped by somebody or if somebody does something for you, then they can hold that over your head, then they owe you. I literally learned how to do everything on my own. I learned how to shoot videos, photography, edit videos, social media marketing, scheduling posts, how to just, you know, get on the microphone and make a good show, how to put a run a show together. Like, you got to be self-sufficient. Nobody's coming to save you. Nobody's coming to help you. And if you learn how to do everything on your own, you will be more appealing to someone that does want to work with you. Another word of advice is like, don't take advice from people who haven't gone where you're trying to go. There are a bunch of people that you'll meet in your life that are going to tell you, that'll never happen. You'll never be on TV. You'll never be on the radio. That's too hard. Why don't you get a real job? That's a fantasy. That's a dream. You can't do that. And what they're doing is projecting on you their own insecurities. Anything is possible. You can do anything you set your mind to. You know, I, I really believe that if you do things on your own and become self-sufficient and you don't listen to the outside noise and you believe in yourself, you're going to eventually get to where you want to go. You just got to have some patience. Okay, so we go to school in New Jersey, and we know that nothing is more annoying than a Mets fan. Tell us about, like, experiences that you've had over the air with a Mets fan, and is that your favorite part of the broadcast, uh, messing with Mets fans? I love it. Uh, so here's the thing, right? My audition night, the first time I got on the fan, the Yankees were having a, a winning streak, and uh, they weren't playing that night, but the Mets played. I came in with this whole idea of, like, talking about the winning streak and every game and what happened and where the Yankees were heading in that 2021 season. And all the Mets fans wanted to do was call and complain about Taiwan Walker <laughs> getting pulled too early and them losing three, two to the Dodgers. And you know what I said that night, not even knowing I'm like, I'm a Yankee fan. I don't care about you guys. I don't watch you guys. Like I don't want to talk about the Mets, but I understand this is New York. We got to talk about the Mets. So I've become the bad guy. I've become the villain. I don't hate the Mets, but I do hate some of these Mets fans because they're super weird, super annoying, super agitated, and they just stay on me all the time because their team sucks. Historically, like, the Mets haven't been good. They punched above their weight class for one year. They won 101 games, and they still couldn't win the division. They won 101 games, and then they got embarrassed in the wild card. So the interactions that I have online with Mets fans, I will say that I, I, I purposely troll them. I drum it up a little more online because I'm myself online. All of them are hiding. Most of them are hiding their identity and their names so they can throw stones and hide their hands. I just keep digging at them and digging at them and digging at them. The truth hurts. If you need me to tell the truth, I don't mind. 
But then when we get on air, I'm on a station with Boomer Esiason, Gio, uh, uh, Greg Giannotti, Sal Licata, Evan Roberts, all of these Mets fans, and they are delusional. And they will twist every story, everything. Oh, King Cohen this, King Cohen that. And then when he doesn't come through, it's like, oh, well, we're taking a different approach. And I'll say, no, 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 no. Let me remind you, this guy is not George Steinbrenner. This guy is a rookie owner. And I just always got to bring them back down to earth. So it's been fun because I'm, I'm a Yankee fan. I'm coming out of the bleachers. I spent a lot of time in Section 203 with the creatures, man. Terror Squad, Bleacher Creatures. Section 203, when you come to a Yankee game and you sit in 203, you're going to hear the sounds in the stadium. It's going to go, ba-dum, ba dum And the creatures are going to say, Met suck. Ba-dum, ba Met suck. Ba-dum, ba dum ba dum ba dum Met suck. We hate the Mets. dun 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 Mets, Mets fans really suck. Ba-dum, Mets fans really suck. It's just like a part of our culture to talk down on the Met fan. And when they start doing the wave, we say, take the wave to Shea. Take the wave to Shea. It's City Field now, but once upon a time it was Shea. So it's just, it's a part of being a Yankee fan. The Yankees are up here, and here we are again, right? We've got Juan Soto, and they can't stop dreaming about Juan Soto. They didn't get Otani. They didn't get Yamamoto. They didn't get Judge. They couldn't keep the Grom. They're probably not keeping Alonzo. They are pathetic. Uh, speaking of Juan Soto, where do you think he ends up next year? We got to see how this year plays out. Everybody's trying to jump the shark. Let's say he has a terrible season. Let's say his value doesn't rise anymore. We don't know where he's going to go. I think the Yankees would still want to give him another shot. I think the Mets are still going to try and go after him. In baseball, New York is the Mecca. New York is the top of the top. New York is the place you want to be. The fans care. The media is there. It's Mets and Yankees. He's got a year in Yankees pinstripes, right? I can't guess where he's going to go, but I, I'd like to hope that he's with the Yankees. But I know he's going to make $600 million. And that's a lot of money for one player, and that's a lot to live up to. Yeah, speaking of the Yankees and Mets, what are your expectations for both of them this year? Uh, I think they're on two different sides of the spectrum, right? Let's start with the Mets. The Mets won 75 games with an asterisk. They really won 74. That Marlins game with the rain technicality gave them 75 wins. They still had the highest payroll in Major League Baseball history. They fired their manager, fired their GM, brought in a new president of baseball operations who came from Milwaukee, and he's brought his Milwaukee style to New York, his small market style to New York. I think that the Mets can overachieve because the bar is set so low. I feel like the Mets, if they win the same amount of games that the Yankees won last year, 82, that's a good season for them. Now, I think their ceiling is like 90. And if you win 90 games, you're a wild card team. So I'm saying the Mets are going to be somewhere between 80 and 90 wins. They have more talent than we're giving them credit for. But they're the Mets. What can go wrong will. Something <laughs> always happens. Now, with the Yankees, unfortunately, the Yankees are the juggernaut. The Bronx Bombers, the big, bad Yankees are back. They've got Juan Soto and Marcus Stroman just threw four hitless innings today. And Alex Verdugo was out there making plays. Aaron Judge is healthy. Rizzo's healthy. We're expecting DJ LeMayu to bounce back. John Carlos Stanton slimmed down. Volpe's not a rookie anymore. Austin Wells is still a rookie. He's going to contribute this year. Oh, Jason Dominguez will be back. So there's a lot of star power. There's a lot of attention and high expectations for the Yankees. Winning the World Series is hard. They haven't done it in 15 years. How, how old are you guys? 14. I was I turned one the day they won the World Series. Exactly. I so was born I was, a few days after. I was in I was in college when they won the last World Series. I had just turned legal drinking age. I, I was just old enough to buy a beer when they won the last World Series. So if I got on this microphone or WFAN and said the Yankees are winning the World Series, that would be nuts. They have to build the champion. They have all the talent. I think the rotation is better than People give them credit for Brian Cashman better have a great trade deadline this year. And I think they can build to being a champion, but they haven't won the world series in 15 years. It's hard to do. I expect them to be an 80 or not 80, a 90 to a hundred win team, but saying that they're going to win the world series is, is crazy. Baseball doesn't work like that. So uh, obviously you're you're a Mets hater and probably also a Pete Alonso hater. Where do you think Pete Alonso ends up next year? 
No, I'm not a Pete Alonso hater. And not even a Mets hater, just a Met fan hater because their fans are, are really dumb and their fans don't understand how baseball works or how free agency works. And they also don't understand that my job is to talk about all the New York sports teams. Yeah, I'm a Yankee fan. I don't have to talk about the Mets the way you would like. I can talk about the Mets however I please. Now, Pete Alonso, I've got a ton of respect for. I go to the All-Star game every year. I see him there every year. I actually went to his party with Julio Rodriguez in Seattle. And he's just a cool dude. And he's always campaigning for other players to come to New York to join the Mets. He wants to be a Met. And he sat around and he watched all these guys get paid. Max Scherzer, Justin Verlander, Francisco Lindor, Brandon Nimmo, Jeff McNeil, Starling Marte. All these guys they traded away like Eduardo Escobar, Mark Canna, Tommy Pham, David Robertson. These guys came in, got paid, left. And he's sitting there like, yo, I'm the face of the franchise. I'm the polar bear. Where's my money? I'm one of the best power hitters in the league. I'm one of the best first basemen in the league. I think Steve Cohen knows how much he means to the Mets. And I think if he has another 40, 50 home run year and stays healthy, the Mets are going to keep him. John Carlos said in this offseason lost a ton of weight. What are your expectations for him this year? I don't, I don't think the weight thing matters. I think last year we saw he looked like he had a piano on his back. He couldn't go second to home. It was taking him three hours to run around the bases. <laughs> Losing weight is like, bro, you're you're an athlete. You're a high-paid athlete. You should be in shape. You should be able to run at the bare minimum. So my expectations are low for him. I said if he can hit 25 home runs this year, great. But what I'll say is Brian Cashman let us know how they view him when he said it seems like getting injured is part of his game. The Yankees have backup plans if he slumps. They will not keep him in the lineup. It's year seven. The last six years, they tried to keep him in the lineup while he slumped. Um, while other guys were hurt, they expected him to carry the team. This year, if he slumps, no, sir. He The only position he can play is DH. They have plenty of outfielders. They don't need him in the outfield. And if he slumps, all they're going to do is put in, like, Trent Grisham in center field, put Judge at DH. When Dominguez comes back, put Dominguez at DH. Put Dominguez in center field and give guys like Glaber Torres, you know, the day um, at DH. And maybe you see DJ LeMay, you play second base. They're just going to move guys around a little bit. I have no expectations for John Carlos Stanton, but I hope he has a chip on his shoulder to come back and prove everyone wrong. I think with Stanton in the past few years, there's been this pattern where like he'll like he'll start hitting well and then he'll get hurt and then it takes him a month to find his timing back. <laughs> like if he can stay healthy or whatever for a few months, have a few good months, that could really like make him have a good year. It's just the timing when he gets injured is what's really messed him up the past few years. He still that has sucks, bro. It's like he is a dominant hitter when he's in a rhythm, when he stays healthy, when he has a lot of at-bats. But when he misses time and he comes back, it takes him weeks to get his swing back, to get his 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 timing down. And we don't have time for that. Definitely not this year. So come on, Stan. I mean, you're one of the highest paid players on the team, one of the highest paid players in the league. You're a former MVP. You hit 59 home runs in 2017. There's got to be something left. I think he's, what, 34 years old now? He's got he's got to find something, or they got to find a way to get him off the team. Yeah, he's thirty. Another Yankee that needs to have another Yankee that needs to have a, back, a bounce back here this year is Carlos Rodon. Give me your expectations for him this couple of years. Yeah, Rodon's contract sucks, and I blame Brian Cashman for defaulting into that. You're paying this guy one hundred and sixty-two million dollars. He was hurt last year. He missed half the year. And the half of the year that he gave us, he was trash. He was garbage. He was a dumpster fire. I mean, he had one good start. Game. What, against the Mets? No, against Boston. Oh, against Boston, yeah. But, like, Boston's a last-place team. Also, uh, it, was, it was two runs of five innings. It wasn't, like, anything that special. Overall, he was bad. That The lasting image is that Royals game where he couldn't get an out. He couldn't get a single out. They had to pull him in the last series of the season against the 106 lost Royals. And he like turned his back on Matt Blake and he was all upset in Anaheim. He was blowing kisses to the fans. I'm like, this guy just doesn't get it. So here's my expectations for him. He also slimmed down. He shaved his mustache. Just stay healthy and give us innings. If you stay healthy and give us innings, there are games where we'll be able to outslug the other team. I'm not expecting him to be an ace. And it sucks that we thought he could be a number two behind Cole. But the Yankees know that he's not a number two. That's why they were trying to get Corbin Burns. That's why they literally offered Blake Snell. And I also think they're going to trade for somebody else before we get to July 30th. 
Yeah, I heard you do talking nets with John Boy. What are your thoughts on the net season this year? Broken. <laughs> broken. The nets are absolutely broken. Yeah. And the organization has made so many mistakes over the last few years. They completely mismanaged their superstar era again. And it, it's misery. It sucks for the fans. They lose to the Pistons last night. They lost to the Grizzlies a few nights ago. They are literally a bottom five team in the NBA any given night. They're one of the worst teams in the NBA. And it's such a fall from grace because everybody wants to talk about, oh, if they would have stayed healthy in 2021, they would have won the finals. So what? That that was here today, gone tomorrow. Kyrie is in Dallas. KD is in Phoenix. Harden is in L.A. And they're all having a great time with better franchises. And the Nets can't figure out how to just put together a three-game winning streak. They can't even figure out a three-game winning streak. If they win back-to-back games, great. They beat the Atlanta Hawks. So, yeah, I started talking Nets with John Boy, and it wasn't my idea. And uh, I, I was able to get some money out of it. I have made some money off of it. I've definitely got some fame and some notoriety and some things from it. But it is miserable being a Nets fan. Yeah, I think that really um, sucks. It's like Kyrie and KD, then Phoenix and Dallas. They both, like, are pretty like mid like they're not that good of teams and if they stand in Brooklyn like like they look scary before KD got hurt last year yeah but you know what the the Me ownership too. Joe Sy he kept trying to put his foot down with the superstars and tell them what to do and that's not how it works in the NBA like these players have all the power it's a player driven league and when you get the superstars you have to acquiesce you have to give them what they want or they're gonna want out and all of those guys forced their way out first it was Harden and then now they have Ben Simmons who shut down for the year. Stupid trade. You never accept a trade for Ben Simmons ever, ever, ever. There's no reason. No other team would have taken that. So Harden forced his way out twice because now he's in L.A. KD asked for a trade two summers ago. He, he, he decided to lock back in. And then Kyrie asked for a trade last trade deadline a year ago. And then KD followed him out the door, and they were a mess after that. They, they don't have a consistent plan. They fired the coach. They, they don't know which way is up, which way is down. There's no direction for this franchise. Uh, back to the Yankee side of things. We know you got a lot of Yankee games. What is your routine when you go to Yankee games? Do you go to Billy's before the game or after? Uh, man, I'm always at Billy's. I'm a regular there. Shout out to Joey. Shout out to Greg. Shout out to all the guys that own and work in Billy's. It is the best sports bar attached to any ballpark arena in the country. And I've been to 16 ballparks. I've been to football stadiums, basketball arenas. Billy's is a huge global like, like icon as far as having a club like that outside a ballpark. You just don't see that in many places, and it's huge. It can fit thousands of people. You guys will grow up and get a chance to go, and I'm sure you've seen on social media. So, yeah, always popping in Billy's because my boy Joey owns the place. Um, but I'm, I'm with the creatures. I'm, I'm at the bodega. I'm at the dugout. I'm at stands. I'm at Twins. I'm everywhere. And that's part of being a Yankee fan. The culture that we have on River Ave, that's part of game day. That's part of game day and night is you show up three hours before first pitch and you get it in. You get lathered up. You get some food. You see other fans. You talk about the game. You talk about the opposing team. And then you go into the Bronx Zoo and you raise hell. Uh, yeah, uh, obviously this is a new stadium, and a lot of people are saying it's worse than the old stadium. What is your favorite memory from the old stadium, and what is better about the new stadium than the old stadium? I never got to the old stadium, and I love telling people that because when I was a kid, nobody took me to the game. Nobody in my family cared about baseball. Nobody cared about the Yankees. My dad wasn't around. I took my mom to her first game in the new stadium, so I never actually stepped foot in the old stadium. Now, people are always going to say that something new is not as good as what it was. People say all the new hosts on WFAN aren't as good as the old hosts, but they still listen every day. The station is thriving. The station is still rating, and we have followers and, and everything else. We still are generating money. What I'll say is the old stadium was a cathedral, and there's not that many cathedrals left in Major League Baseball. Fenway, Wrigley, like, they knock all these ballparks down and they rebuild them. And that's what George Steinbrenner wanted to do. We still have a great ballpark. It is a museum to some people, though. It is not as historic as the old ballpark was. But what I like about Yankee Stadium is if you figure out your way to get to the high class luxury spots like Legends, 
and the suites, it's better than most of the stadiums in the country. It is for rich people. <laughs> like if, if, if you can figure out how to rub shoulders with the rich and famous in Yankee Stadium, the amenities are, are second to none. Yeah, thank you for coming on, Keith. It was a good episode. Uh, and remember to like and subscribe. We got some more good content coming out there. Mario Gomez, Max Manis, all scheduled to make appearances in the next couple of weeks. And we'll see you guys later. Thank you, Keith. Yes, sir.